This is a special video where I show my gratitude for helping the channel reach 1000 subscribers. Also, today marks 6 months since the time I launched Property Noma. So to celebrate these two special occasions, I'll be answering 10 of your questions that you've left on the videos that I've published in that time. I've grouped the questions according to their topics, which are mostly from interlocking stabilized soil blocks, EPS panels, the biodigester sanitation system, and precast concrete wall panels. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And once again, thanks for your support. For the first group of questions, they come from the topic of interlocking stabilized soil blocks. Question number one comes from Don. He asks, what is cheaper, lime or cement? What needs to be added to create a waterproof block, unlike cement blocks that absorb moisture? What are the dimensions, weight? How long is curing? What is the ratio between sand, clay, cement or lime? Is that by volume or weight? For question number one, I'll focus on the mixed ratio between soil and cement. For the other questions that Don asked, I'll put them in upcoming questions, specifically question two, which will talk about waterproofing, and question three, which will talk about interlocking stabilized soil block machines. For other aspects like dimension, weight, the curing process, those are best answered in a video which I published a while back on the channel. I've put a link to that video in the description below. Before we talk about the mix ratios, it's important to understand the role of cement to ISSBs. Cement is the stabilizer that holds the soil together. And it's this holding of the soil together that makes the ISSB block possible. Without cement, even after compression of the block, the soil will still collapse because there's nothing that holds it together. So that's why cement is added. Now, when it comes to lime, lime is added to high clay content soil. But most ISSB contractors don't use high clay soil because it's unreliable and expands and shrinks a lot. A good example of this kind of soil is black cotton soil which is not recommended to make ISSBs. The most popular soil that is used to make ISSBs is quarry soil, which is obtained from the extraction of natural stones from quarries. To contractors, this soil is readily available and is cheap, which also makes it cheaper to you as a client. Quarry soil is also very fine in nature, which is suitable to make high quality interlocking stabilized soil blocks. The color of the block will depend on the soil that is obtained from the quarry. There are some that are gray in color, some that are brown to red in color, and all of these just depends on the soil that is available at the quarry. If you have red soil on your site, that can also be used. The subsoil or maram layer is extracted, which is found just below the topsoil. And that's the layer that is recommended to make interlocking stabilized soil blocks. Before mixing the soil, the soil is passed through a sieve to ensure that large particles are trapped so that they don't hamper the final quality of the block. Water is also added during the mixing process to activate cement that is available inside the mix. This activation of cement is important to start the curing process and to give the blocks their strength. Now, the typical mix ratio of cement to quarry soil is one bag of cement to six wheelbarrows of quarry soil. If you're using red soil, a typical mix ratio is one bag of cement, four wheelbarrows of sand, and six wheelbarrows of red soil. Again, these mix ratios will depend on your project and your ISSB contractor will advise you which mix is suitable for your project. Question number two deals with the waterproofing ability of ISSBs and it comes from Timothy. He asks, could you share 
more on waterproofing these blocks since this is a common challenge due to they being porous. Some of us would also try fencing. If you're interested to learn more about waterproofing interlocking stabilized soil blocks, there's a study done in 2012 by Jonathan Chu, which was shared to the channel by David. So thanks a lot, David. For the sake of this video, I'll talk about three things you can do to make ISSBs more waterproof. The first thing is to apply an oil-based varnish to the blocks. The oil-based varnish prevents water from seeping into the blocks because oil and water don't mix. Two, you can make your roof overlap your wall to create an eave. So this will prevent rainwater from splashing into the blocks and damaging them with time. Three, you can opt to plaster your walls as this is something that is possible but it comes at a cost to you. On my part, I'm doing more research on this aspect of waterproofing. I'll share it once I learn more on the topic. Question number three deals with ISSB machines. And the question comes from Ali, where he asks where he can find the machines and if the machines ship to India. The honest answer to that question is I don't know because I don't work for the companies. I usually leave links to the companies in the description section of the video. From my research, I've realized that there are two types of ISSB machines. One, there's the manually powered ISSB machine. And two, there's the hydraulic powered ISSB machine. The manual machine comes from Makiga and the hydraulic powered ISSB machine comes from Hydraform. I've left links to those companies in the description section of this video. The second group of questions comes from the topic of EPS panels. Sana asks how strong EPS panels are and if someone can easily scrape the outside layer. To answer Sana, EPS panels by themselves are not structurally strong. They can't support the weight of a structure, which is why concrete is applied to them. It's the concrete that gives EPS panels their strength. Now, there are various classes of concrete. Generally, the higher the class of concrete, the stronger that concrete is. The class of concrete that will be used will depend on your project, your climate, your environment, and other design criteria. Once concrete hardens, it's very difficult to scrape the outside layer. Question number five comes from Zaza. It looks shaky and shady. Also, not many have experience. How long does it last or do the workers know how to use it? I can understand where Zaza comes from and it's something that I've talked about in previous videos on alternative building technologies and that is perception. Most people tend to shy away from technologies that are not familiar with them. And the most familiar materials that are used, especially where I'm based from in Kenya, is stone blocks. So technologies like EPS panels have to fight negative perception from the market. And when you buy EPS panels or when you see them on site before concrete is applied to them, they look very light and they look like they can't support the weight of a structure. But as I've said in question four, it's the concrete that gives the EPS panels their strength. And in some cases, depending on the class of concrete that is used, you may discover that an EPS wall is stronger than a stone block wall. In question six, Paul asks, can I use EPS panels together with the normal stones, e.g. Can I use the panels to make a slab on top of the stone walls? Yes, it's possible. And the product that is used is called the floor EPS panels. So you can build your walls using stone blocks or bricks. And on top of them, you can put the floor EPS panels to make a slab. If you want to learn more about the floor EPS panel, I made a video which you can check out from the link in the description. Moving to question seven. Revelations asks, what about storms such as hurricanes? This was a question on EPS panels 
And the idea behind the question is whether EPS panels can withstand the force of such extreme weather conditions. Again, EPS panels get their strength from concrete. So your structural engineer can choose to use a high strength concrete that can withstand the huge forces of wind from hurricanes. Also, the wall panels can be reinforced with rebars to give the panels more strength to withstand such extreme weather conditions. The next two questions come from precast concrete wall panels. For question eight, Zuko asks, can the panels support two to three story house? No, and that's because precast concrete wall panels are used for partitioning purposes. But that being said, they can support the weight of a single story house. A good example of this is a bungalow. But beyond that, precast concrete wall panels can't support the weight of double or triple or more storied buildings. The job goes to beams, columns, and the slabs of such structures. Kevin asks in question 9, is it possible to connect these precast panels using bolts or similar joints? It's not possible because of how precast concrete wall panels are designed. They have an interlocking feature that helps them kiss each other to form seamless joints between one panel to the next one. Also, because they interlock, you minimize the amount of mortar you need between the joints. You only plaster the exterior face of the wall to conceal the interlocking joint. Finally, question 10 comes from the biodigester sanitation system. Andrew asks, why do you install a degreaser just before the biodigester inlet? Does the kitchen waste water go through the biodigester or does it go direct to the soak pit via different piping system? Very good questions, which I'll answer right away. The degreaser is added to trap any fats and oils present in kitchen wastewater. These fats and oils can later on block the piping system connecting the biodigester sanitation system. Now, the wastewater flows into the biodigester through the inlet pipe. When that happens, it will displace any water that is inside the biodigester. The displaced water is directed to the outlet pipe and into the soak pit. So that's how it flows from the inlet pipe to the biodigester and from the biodigester through the outlet pipe and into the soak pit. The soak pit is the final step in the biodigester system where further sanitation occurs. I'm humbled that in six months, you guys have made the channel reach 1000 subscribers. It's a huge honor as it's something that I'm really passionate about. The idea is to help you as an aspiring home builder, contractor, property developer, entrepreneur, or wherever you are through the channel. It's been a huge learning process for me from the many hours I've spent doing research and from the site visits that I go to to meet contractors and people from all walks of life. In future, I'm planning to launch a website where you will find written articles, online courses, and other good stuff. But I'll need your help with that. If you want to support the channel financially, you can do so by donating through a platform called Buy Me A Coffee. The link is found in the description below. Once again, thanks for subscribing, watching, liking, sharing, and commenting my videos. It has really helped the channel out. That's it for this Q&A video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.